Okay, well, I want to welcome you guys to the official LionCon after party. We are excited you guys are here. We're really excited to share our research with you. My name is Mark Newlin, and I work as a wireless security researcher at Bastille Networks. You may have seen some of my work last year. I did a couple projects called Mouse Tracking Key Sniffer, a bunch of vulnerabilities that I found in wireless mice and keyboards, which I presented here at DEF CON. Two other projects I've worked on that are kind of interesting are these two DARPA challenges. I competed in the DARPA Shredder Challenge in 2011, which was a competition to reassemble shredded documents. And I wrote some cool software for that and finished that competition in third place out of the 9,000 teams. Then I went on to do the DARPA Spectrum Challenge, which is how I got into software-defined radio. And despite not going to college myself, I managed to best some other university teams and finish the first tournament of that competition in second place. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Christopher Grayson. Uh, my handle is Lava Lamp. I'm originally from Atlanta. I went to Georgia Tech twice. Uh, I've been a research scientist with DARPA, working on the DARPA Center program. I used to be the head of the Georgia Tech Hacking Club. I've also been a security consultant with the boutique security consultancy Bishop Fox. Uh, and most recently, I am the founder and principal engineer of a software security platform entitled Website, uh, which I open sourced all the software for a few days ago <laughs> at Arsenal. So if you like attack surface enumeration, you should totally check it out. Hey everyone, I'm Logan Lamb. I got my professional start at Oak Ridge National Lab, where I focused primarily on static and symbolic analysis of binaries. From there, I went to Bastille Networks, where I'm currently at, doing wireless work with software-defined radio. Some previous work you all may be familiar with, in 2014, I found some vulnerabilities affecting home security systems. And I was actually supposed to be up on one of these stages back then, but it didn't quite work out. <laughs> However, it did lead to a lawsuit and a $16 million settlement from ADT, so that's something. More recently, I found some vulnerabilities affecting the uh, election systems in the state of Georgia, and that's culminated in an ongoing lawsuit to contest the results of the most recent special election. So the scope of this talk is 26 vulnerabilities we have discovered in ISP-provided wireless gateways, set-top boxes, and voice remotes. We found vulnerabilities in hardware from Cisco, Eris, Technicolor, Motorola, and Xfinity. We have multiple unauthenticated remote code execution attack chains. And we have a variety of both network and application vulnerabilities, some Wi-Fi vulnerabilities, and then some ZigBee RF4 CE vulnerabilities. And you might be asking yourself, you know, why does this matter? We see cable modem vulnerabilities and Wi-Fi vulnerabilities fairly frequently, but the scope of this is unlike anything that's been done fairly recently. We have some vulnerabilities that are specific to services provided by certain ISPs. We have some vulnerabilities that are specific to certain hardware vendors. And the majority of the vulnerabilities we found are in the open source software stack called RDK, which runs on many of the devices we looked at. I want to point out that the attack chains affecting the Comcast Xfinity devices have been remediated as of today. We're going to start with some background on the RDK software stack, then going to get into some of the type of devices that run RDK. We're going to tell you about where this project started and how we got from our humble beginnings to where we are now. We're then going to get into the meat of the talk, which is the vulnerabilities we found. And I want to point out that we found too many vulnerabilities to cover in depth in 45 minutes. But we do have a 35-page white paper that is up on GitHub right now that we recommend you read if you want more details. We're then going to discuss the specific devices we looked at, as well as the disclosure process and remediation actions taken by the affected vendors. And then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Cool. So we're going to start off with a little bit of a background on RDK. So you know, we start looking at these modems and these set-top boxes. We gain a shell. We get access to the file system. Start looking around. And we keep seeing references to this acronym RDK. And we don't really know what it is. Uh, but doing a little bit more digging, it's uh, the Reference Development Kit. And basically what this is is an open source software stack uh, that is designed to be placed on consumer premise equipment uh, that deals with media. So we're talking about cable mode, we're talking about set-top boxes, we're talking, well, I don't know if that was, we're talking about basically anything that goes uh, in a home that has to deal with media. Uh, and so, you know, we see this, we're like, oh, cool, we really like open source software, it's pretty cool that open source software is being deployed on these devices, uh, that's fantastic. And uh, so the, the RDK uh, code base actually was founded in 2012. And then we do a little bit more digging. And so this is really like open source question mark software. Uh, so before we realized that it was open source, uh, we thought that we stumbled upon, upon like, you know, a treasure trove of data that we weren't supposed to be able to have access to uh, because we found all of the code. So like we're talking about the different web applications, we're talking about the operating system, the various like daemons that, that, that reside on these devices. Uh, but then we're like, oh, it's actually open source. Okay, well, this isn't such a great find anyways. Um, so you can right now go to code.rdkcentral.com and pull down all of this software uh, if you want to take a look. 
And so we're really getting, you know, feeling pretty jazzed about this. Like, this is pretty cool that all this open source software is being deployed. And then we do a who is lookup on rdkcentral.com, and that's when the eyebrows started uh, being raised. Uh, if you can see what's over here on the screen, uh, the technical name for the uh, who is record for rdkcentral.com is Comcast Domains. So this is where things start getting a little bit hairier because uh, you can go to this website, you can pull down these repos, uh, and you can do git log and grep for the word vulnerability, uh, and you will get pages and pages of vulns that have been patched in this software. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we definitely want these vulns to be patched. We want the software that we use to be secure. But where this gets a little bit kind of weird is these patches are not really being pushed to consumers in any rapid kind of process. So we're looking at 6 to 12 to 18 months before these patches that are in these publicly available repositories are actually pushed to consumer premise equipment. Uh, so what sort of vulnerabilities are we talking about? Well, it really runs the gamut. We're talking about remote code execution, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, memory corruption, you name it, they got it. And if you go to these repositories and look for these changes, like these are, these are vulnerabilities that are present in these code bases. And so the thing that uh, really kind of made our eyes grow raise the most was that as far as we could tell, uh, you know, these are known vulnerabilities, they're being patched, uh, none of the customers that these affect are being informed, and there are no CVEs being filed for either. All right, y'all, so I'm gonna give a quick overview of the devices that run RDK, give you some reasons ISPs choose RDK, and point out some salient tidbits that will be relevant later in the talk. So there are two major categories of devices that run RDK. The first is set-top boxes, which run uh, RDK video. The second are gateways, which run RDK broadband. Uh, a gateway, in the most literal sense, is a combination modem and Wi-Fi access point. So, why do, yeah, why do ISPs choose RDK? Well, they choose RDK because it gets them about 90% of the way to a completed software stack. It comes out of the box with fantastic remote management for when you need to manage tens of millions of devices. It has excellent diagnostics, very verbose logging. I hear they have a security subsystem. We haven't actually seen that yet, but I hear it's a thing. And they have a media framework which runs on RDK video. And it's pretty neat. Uh, in the media framework, you have closed captioning, video on demand, pay-per-view. It, it handles the transport of audio and video to your television, and it does DRM. Uh, all out of the box. Okay, so RDK video. This device that you're looking at right now, it's a Motorola XG1 set-top box. This is the same one that we shelled working on it in Atlanta. Uh, we haven't actually taken one of these apart yet. This is a picture from the FCC documentation. Uh, we didn't need to take it apart. Um, once you get a shell on one of these devices, uh, it really just looks like any other embedded Linux device. It's really architecturally not that interesting. Uh, it's just running a lot of RDK-based software. Uh, there should be a lot of future work here. There's all sorts of I.O., and we have TR069 and Mocha uh, over coax. And you, you guys should look at that. Uh, things to remember for later. The way these devices work Everything you see and hear on your television is actually being rendered inside of a WebKit-based browser engine, meaning everything is happening inside of a browser on your set-top box. And that's pretty cool, right? It, it makes development a lot easier. What could possibly go wrong? What, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and uh, you can plug in a keyboard and a mouse and interact with your set-top box, and that's cool. And it leads to some clarity later on. All right. So now we come to gateways, RDK broadband. Uh, in the most literal sense, it's a combination modem and router in one enclosure, okay? Uh, in RDK B parlance, we have a network processor and an application processor. So we've cracked apart at least half a dozen makes and models of these devices. And they all are nearly exactly the same both uh, internally and externally. You have two distinct systems on a single board running two different operating systems, okay? Uh, they normally run embedded Linux, 
But every once in a while, we'll see one running ECOS, which is a real-time operating system on the network processor. Uh, and these two devices communicate over a switch in ways that are defined by RDK broadband. Uh, things to remember for later in the talk. Just because you pop one of these devices doesn't necessarily mean you fully own the entire box, right? Yeah. I don't know about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll find out, right? We'll see. And um, Puma is Intel's take on RDK broadband hardware architecture. And for Intel Puma, the network processor is an ARM core and the application processor is an Atom core. So after I finished research on the mouse tracking key sniffer projects, I knew I wanted to do more vulnerability research, but I didn't have a good concept of what devices would be fun to look at. And at this point, I was still kind of naively assuming that these mature devices from big industry players are going to be well locked down and free of vulnerabilities. And as we'll see, this is not the case, but this was my assumption at the time. So last year, I made my way to Hack in the Box in Amsterdam, and I saw a talk by Peter Geisler. And Peter had demonstrated that he could reverse engineer the algorithm that he used to generate the default SSID and passphrase on the wireless gateway provided by his ISP. And this was kind of a light bulb moment when I realized that people were still finding interesting wireless vulnerabilities in this ISP provided equipment. So I decided I would go home and do the same with my ISP gear at home. And unfortunately, I had a pretty busy year last year. And so it wasn't until December when I had time to look at this. And so I started looking at this project. And about a week later, I was dropping my keys off at Chris's house because he was kind enough to watch my cats when my fiance and I were up in Seattle for Christmas. And it turned out that Chris was a prior customer at the same ISP and had also looked at his wireless gateway once upon a time. And we both had an interest in this type of research. So we decided to team up and see what we could find. And the nice thing about Chris is that he has a background in pen testing, so he knew about things like application security and network security. And so that first night, he taught me what Netcat was, he taught me how to use Nmap, and we were able to leverage a previously disclosed vulnerability in the wireless gateway I used to pull off the file system. We're also able to start digging into the RDK repositories and just get a general idea of how these devices operated. And pretty soon, we had some novel vulnerabilities, and soon after that, we had some novel wireless vulnerabilities. And at this point, we brought the project to my employer, Bastille, which is a wireless security company, and we disclosed everything through my work. After some more vulnerabilities and some more work on this, Chris and I had an impasse where we needed some hardware expertise. So we brought Logan into the fold to leverage his hardware and embedded expertise. And then we were able, between the three of us, to find all kinds of vulnerabilities in these wireless gateways, and then leverage what we learned from the wireless gateways to start getting root shells on the set-top boxes. And because we were finding these vulnerabilities over the course of several months, we disclosed the vulnerabilities to the affected vendors in four groups. So now let's get into the really fun part of the talk, which is these vulnerabilities. <laughs> and that's my cat, Tim, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, because my initial interest in this was sparked by Peter Geisler's talk, I was hoping to figure out how the default Wi-Fi SSID and passphrase were generated on my wireless gateway. And I never figured that out, but my motivation was to really look at the different wireless things running on this box. And one of the first things Chris and I discovered is that there are multiple plain text configuration files which contain all kinds of hard-coded credentials and dynamic credentials, including all of the Wi-Fi configuration for the devices. And I saw what appeared to be a hidden Wi-Fi network that I was not previously aware of on my device. And it had an SSID of XHS hyphen and then eight hex characters representing the lower four bytes of the CM Mac on my wireless gateway. And the CM Mac is not normally known, and it's a unique identifier for the device used for provisioning and other things. And the passphrase for this hidden Wi-Fi network was 16 hex characters, and this just felt like it was going to be generated dynamically. So I started grubbing around for words like calculate and generate and XHS and key and PSK, and pretty soon I found this method called calculate PSK key in a shared library. What could that function possibly do? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the shared library, it turns out, has extremely verbose debug output via printf statements. So I was able to run just strings on the shared library and trace the flow of execution through this method. And it appeared that it was consuming a MAC address and spitting out a Wi-Fi passphrase. So I bubbled around and got together a cross-compilation tool chain, and I compiled a binary which linked against the shared library, put it on the gateway, and ran it, and it actually consumed the CMAC and produced a passphrase for this hidden Wi-Fi network. And so what is this Wi-Fi network used for? There is a hidden home security Wi-Fi network on these devices. So if you have this home security service provided by these ISPs, you can get a wireless touchscreen control panel which connects to the internet through your wireless gateway. And the way it connects to the wireless gateway is through this hidden home security Wi-Fi network. The thing is that I did not have the home security service, so this network was enabled even though I did not have this service. So now we have a hidden Wi-Fi network on my wireless gateway. 
we know that if we, if we can get this CM MAC, we can generate the credentials for this Wi Fi network. And once we're on this network, we found multiple network services which we can exploit for root command execution. So now the question is how do we get the CM MAC to generate the credentials for this hidden Wi Fi network? So it turns out that a lot of these devices have a public Wi Fi hotspot, in this case, Xfinity Wi Fi. And if you're a customer of this ISP, you can connect to this Wi Fi network on any one of these devices and access the internet. It's a pretty cool service. But it turns out that when you connect to this Wi Fi network, you get a DHCP lease, and the DHCP ACK actually contains the CM MAC. So you connect to this public Wi Fi hotspot. In the DHCP ACK, you get the CM MAC, you can then <laughs> generate the credentials for the hidden Wi Fi network, connect to that, and get root on the box. <laughs> good, good. And so it turns out there's also a IPv6 multicast packet that's broadcast unencrypted every four seconds from these, these devices. And this packet, I'm not quite sure why this is transmitted, but it contains this, the MAC address of another network interface on the device. This is the L2SD0.500 network interface. The MAC address of this network interface has a deterministic offset from the CM MAC. So you can listen to the Wi Fi channel that the device is using for four seconds retrieve this packet, convert that MAC address into the CM MAC, generate the credentials, and root the box. And then a lot of these devices also have VOIP service. The VOIP interface has a public IPv4 address. That public IPv4 address has a fully qualified domain name which contains the MAC address of the network interface used for this VOIP connection. Also in this FQDN is a region code and you can determin uh, deterministically translate this MAC address into the CM MAC. So this means that you can get a reverse DNS database, pull down the list of all of the possible VOIP MAC addresses in your region, turn those into CM MACs, and the full list of all the hidden SSIDs and passphrases in your region. And as I was thinking about these uh, MAC addresses and IP addresses, I noticed that the IPv6 address of the WAN0 interface in these devices was generated from the CM MAC. And the WAN0 interface, in this case, is facing the Comcast infrastructure. And so, if you know anything about IPv6, it's a 64 bit address, which is a pretty large search base, but if you generate it from a known 32 bit address, it's much easier to find. So, we're trying to figure out, you know, why might they be generating these IPv6 addresses from the CMX? And so, it turns out that on these devices, you have a web UI that you can hit from the LAN, but if you hit the device from this ISP facing IPv6 address, you can also log into the web UI with hard coded or daily generated credentials or log in via SSH. And we weren't sure how exactly we could access this because we are, as a customer, not on the ISP network. So it turns out there's a service called Xfinity Send to TV. And this is pretty cool. So you can go to Xfinity.com slash send to TV, you put in a URL, you hit go, log in with your ISP credentials, and then on your TV via your set top box, you can view this website. So we thought, what happens if we put in the IPv6 address of a wireless gateway? Well, it turns out that you can actually load up the web UI and you look like you're coming from the ISP infrastructure, and then you can log into this with either hard coded credentials or daily generated credentials. And so these daily generated credentials are called a password of the day. This is used by many ISPs. We've only looked at the Comcast variant. In this case, there's actually a binary which resides on the wireless gateway which generates this via a cron job that fires at 12.05 a.m. So we thought, what if we just fire this ourselves and spoof the date? So we can actually generate all the future passwords of the day for these devices. And then you want to do the app. Yeah. Do it right now. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, we're gonna do. We're gonna show you a quick video of what that actually looks like. Uh, and so what you're going to see in this video is using the Sensor TV service, you're going to see that we are gaining access to another modem uh, via that process, and then at the end of the video you'll see what happened once the actual patch was applied, and see that instead of gaining access to that modem, it just hangs. It's a really great service. So now we're putting in the IPv6 address of a wireless gateway from a different customer account than the set -top box we're using. So this is on the TV. We're watching some NASA stuff. As you do. And all of a sudden we have this access. And this is hard coded credentials to log into another customer's wireless gateways web UI. And so, and here's the video of it not working. So then, uh, now that it's been patched, this is no longer possible. Yeah. Okay. 
And so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the wireless devices and wireless networks on these wireless gateways. And so I decided to take a look at these public Wi Fi hotspots. And the way this works, if you're a customer, you can connect to any one of these Wi Fi hotspots, you sign in with your ISP username and password. And then you get to access the internet, which is pretty great because then you have some tens of millions of free Wi Fi hotspots around the country. The next time you sign in or connect to one of these, you do not have to provide your credentials. And what's happening is that your device is remembered based on the MAC address of your Wi Fi network interface. So, an attacker can simply observe all of the authenticated and connected devices on these public Wi-Fi hotspots. The attacker could then spoof the MAC address of an actual connected customer, use that MAC address, connect to a different Wi-Fi hotspot, and gain the internet access for free. Now, what's interesting is that free internet's great, but any malicious activity performed by the attacker is then attributed to the customer they're spoofing. Awesome. So uh, we've talked a lot about how you actually gain access to these devices, but what do you do once you're on these networks? Uh, so I'm going to talk about three separate things that you can do. There's plenty more. We highly recommend that you look at our white paper. Uh, and the first thing that I'm going to talk about is Fast CGI. And so Fast CGI is a successor to CGI, which is the Common Gateway Interface Protocol. And what uh, CGI is is basically a way for a web server to be able to invoke processes dynamically. So uh, you know, back in the day, we were only serving up static content from web, web servers, and this is what enabled web servers to uh, you know invoke a PHP interpreter, invoke you know what have you based on a web request. So it's kind of the birth of the dynamic web. Um, so CGI was the initial protocol. Fast CGI uh, was a you know improvement upon it. It had a bunch of obvious uh, speed up gains. Uh, and one of the other things that uh, it, it implemented as well was not only could you now listen on Unix domain sockets, but you could also listen on TCP sockets. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, so uh, the interesting thing about this is there's actually no RFC for fast CGI. And it's relied upon by a bunch of web servers you've probably never heard of, like Apache and Nginx and like Sun Web Server and like really everything uses fast CGI. Uh, but there's still no RFC. Uh, if anybody can find an RFC, please let us know. Uh, the only documentation that we could find is actually the white paper uh, from the MIT student that drafted this protocol back in 1996. So something that's ubiquitously relied upon, but the like, most recent documentation we have is 21 years old. Uh, there's three modes of operation that the fast CGI service can operate in, uh, one of which is responder. And so responder is, I'm going to talk to you via this fast CGI protocol, I'm going to give you a bunch of information about an HTTP request, and I'm going to specify a file path on the local disk, and that's the file that I want you to pass to the interpreter. Um, the authorizer mode of operation is uh, I'm going to give you all the information about the HTTP request via the fast CGI protocol, uh, and then instead of giving me back any content, you're just going to tell me, yes, this request is authorized, or no, this request is not authorized. The third mode of operation, which I have yet to find implemented, which is very disappointing, uh, is called filter. And filter is the exact same as responder, where you're going to give it a bunch of information about an HTTP request, but instead of specifying a local file path, you just give it the file to run. So you can see why I would be disappointed that I haven't found that yet. So uh, let's talk about the PHP Fast CGI Process Manager, or PHP FPM. Uh, this is a way to get uh, PHP deployed on embedded devices very easily. I mean, you can, you know, it's not just embedded devices, it's any device, but it's very heavily relied upon by embedded devices. Uh, and it's Fast CGI coupled with PHP. Um, and it gives you some really cool additional functionality on top of Fast CGI, uh, like you have the ability to reconfigure the PHP environment on every request. Huh. If anybody's used PHP before, you, you might be like, oh, that's bad. Uh, so, and also, by the way, if you're ever doing research and you Google a technology and the first result comes up with a big red box that says, hey, by the way, there's some security precautions you probably want to consider, you're going in the right direction, I promise. Uh, <laughs> so basically, you talk fast CGI, you use the binary fast CGI protocol, you talk to it, uh, you're able to reconfigure the PHP uh, you know, environment on every single request, uh, you supply HTTP post data via standard in, um, and so if only there was a way that you could abuse this to get code execution. Uh, so it turns out there is, and basically uh, there is a PHP configuration value that is uh, given a file path. And that file path points to a file that is going to be run before the actual file you're requesting. So, you know, maybe the idea behind this is you've got a big PHP application, but you have a script that bootstraps your entire environment ahead of time. So instead of actually including it or requiring it, you just reconfigure PHP to say, just run that file before anything else. So PHP also has some really interesting file scheme handlers, uh, one of which is PHP colon slash slash STDIN. And this is just a reference to standard in. 
We supply HTTP POST data via standard in to the PHP interpreter. So how do we put this all together? Well, in the fast EGI request, we basically say, hey, uh, before you run anything else, run that file first, and the file description we give it is pointing to standard in, and then all the HTTP POST data that we supply is then used as code. It's passed to the PHP interpreter. So some of you might be saying that this is old news, and uh, to, a, to an extent, you're right. Uh, CVE 2012-1823 described precisely this attack chain uh, where you're abusing the PHP configuration uh, to gain code execution. Uh, that is not this, though. The difference between the two is that was actually piggybacking on top of an HTTP request. So there's a way that you could abuse the query string to supply this data, gain code execution, but it was, again, based on top of an HTTP request. This, we're just talking straight to the daemon. So the daemon is bound on TCP ports 1026 through 1029 on all interfaces on these RDK devices. Uh, so if you see it there, you can probably talk to it. Uh, and basically, uh, this, one of the reasons that this wasn't, well, we assume one of the reasons that this hasn't been found before is when you nmap, nmap does not recognize fast CGI. It just sees it as TCP wrapped. Uh, so we uh, also recommend that you check out the GitHub repository that we've supplied alongside our talk because we've written an nmap NSE script which will actually identify fast CGI uh, and you can do all sorts of fun things with that. So one last note before I go on to the next one. Uh, in PHP FPM as compiled on RDK, this functionality has been compiled out. You can't actually reconfigure PHP with every request. And we could not find any documentation for how you would do this. If this is something that's seen as like, oh yeah, this is a security flaw, this is something that we expect, you would also anticipate that there's documentation for, hey, here's how you compile this out. But as far as we could find, that did not exist. So for some reason this has been compiled out, we don't know why, uh, but it was probably intentional because this is default fun functionality, but lo and behold, we didn't actually need it to gain code execution because you can just request files on disk, you can bypass the control flow uh, that you would expect to see in the actual web app, and you can do some crazy stuff like that. So let's keep it going. Uh, I'm gonna talk about sysEventD right now. Uh, you may have heard of sysEventD before. This is, a, this is what we were, this is us uh, actually doing this research. Uh, so you may have heard of sysEventD before. It's on TCP for 52367. Uh, the sysEventD you may have heard of is not this. There's Oracle sysEventD. This is completely separate. This is a proprietary, uh, proprietary service built just for RDK. Uh, and the reason that it exists is you can basically say when this event happens on an operating system, do X, Y, Z. Uh, so, you know, basically event-based programming within an operating system for embedded devices. Uh, there's no authentication, no authorization. If you know how to talk to protocol, fantastic. You can do whatever you want with it. So, in order to abuse this event D, the first thing that you do, and also, by the way, they really handily just provide you with a binary that knows how to speak this protocol in RDK, uh, so you don't have to write any of your own stuff. But the first step is you set up an event, and the event, you have two arguments to. You basically say, here's the, here's the binary, I want there, there to be fired, and here's the name of the event, and that registers the event in the system. And then the next thing you do to trigger the event, you, uh, you basically trigger the event name, which is what you see up in, here in step two, and you pass it an argument. And when you do that, what happens is the binary that you uh, configured the event with in step one is called, and the first argument to the binary is the name of the event, and the second argument to the binary is the value that you triggered the event with. Now, oh, what do you do with this? Well, typically, this is what we would assume this is being used for, like, oh, let's say that there's a log file that's like placed on disk, and as soon as that log file is placed on disk, it's like, oh, we want to copy that to a separate directory. Uh, so that's what you see up here, that like maybe when this XML file hits the disk, it's actually going to be copied into another location and be exfiltrated somewhere else. But what we wanted to do was gain, you know, arbitrary code execution. So if you create an event with a binary of bin bash and an event name of dash C, then whatever you supply to the event is just passed as, as arguments to bin bash. Code execution as root, fantastic. <laughs> so where is this at? Uh, it's bound to all interfaces. Across the entire IPv4 address space, we found 149,000 instances of it. Uh, we don't really know why these weren't firewalled off, but the majority of them were. Uh, but basically, if you gain access to any of these lands, you'll probably see other sysEventD or fastCGI. And the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is a tale of two operating systems. So as Logan was talking about before, these devices actually have two separate operating systems on them. Uh, one of them uh, is what you would expect to see when you open up your browser, you go to configure your modem, that's at 10.0.0.1, that's an ARM side. Uh, and then there's a system on a chip that kind of handles all of the networking stuff uh, that is an Atom, uh, Atom instance, and this is usually at the top 
of the DHCP range that you're getting leases into right underneath the broadcast address. So the Atom instance is uh, going to be at 10.0.0.254 in most cases. And this, to this day, I don't know why this works. Uh, so, so, you know, we have a lot of really complimentary skill sets up here. And uh, so I come over to Mark's place one day and he shows me, you know, he's teaching himself how to do this networking stuff. He's like, hey, I did this. And I was like, that's not supposed to work. Like, that's not a thing. That's not supposed to happen. So uh, the Atom side has an interface that has an IP address in the 169254 range, which is not generally supposed to be used. It's not supposed to be routable. Uh, so it turns out that you can add a routing rule to your device that says, hey, when I'm trying to talk to 169.25401, 10 254 is my gateway. And then you can talk to the private interface on the Atom side, and it just forge traffic. I don't know if that's supposed to happen. I really think it's not. Uh, but this is pretty fantastic. I was like, Mark, what the hell? What, oh my god. Uh, and so once you actually have access to this, you see the results of the Nmap output out here. You see ports 1026 through 1029 open. Those are the fast CGI services that we were talking about before. Again, you have code execution. Fantastic. All right, y'all. So I'm going to walk you through our suite of vulnerabilities affecting set-top boxes and voice remotes. So the first three affect set-top boxes, then I'm going to have a hard transition to some wireless work, then I'm going to bring the rooted set-top box back into the mix. All right, so for those of you who don't know, Mark Newland is really good at slapping keys, okay? Uh, <laughs> he's really good at it, especially so in the context of set-top boxes. He plugged a keyboard into his set-top box, proceeded to touch every key that it could, hit every key combination that he could think of, and then we, uh, this popped up on the television. Uh, remote web inspector enabled. That's, that was surprising. Also, he was what? bashing a bunch of stuff and like the screen split in two and like a bunch of, it, it was pretty, it was it, pretty, it was pretty it, wacky. Yeah. Uh, but this is in fact real life. So, uh, remote web inspector, it's basically like Firebug for Firefox or dev tools for Chrome where web developers can debug their web pages. And that's really great when you're trying to find, you know, vulnerabilities in something that's running this. And uh, you can actually hit this from over the internet, so that's pretty cool, right? So uh, there was another key combination that you could hit, and it would pull up a hidden diagnostic menu. I, I'm totally that guy. Somebody's dying, I'm pretty sure. I'm totally that guy. <laughs> All right, so uh, we could hit a key combination and pull up a hidden diagnostics menu. We uh, just perused this diagnostics menu and looked at the network traffic between the set-top box and whatever services it was hitting. Uh, lo and behold, there was a route, just by the name of the route, made us think we could get arbitrary file reads on the set-top box. If you were to post a legitimate file route, file path to a file on the file system, you could just get the contents of that file, and it worked. Yeah, so that's kind of neat, right? And uh, since this is RDK and it's so standardized, we already had a good idea of all of the interesting things we wanted to look at. Woo! <laughs> all right, so uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, I've got a pro tip. It's generally best not to get random input from the internet and then execute it locally Especially right? as root. Especially uh, I think you're root. not supposed to do that. No, I don't think so. Pro tip. No. Yeah, so sanitize your inputs, guys. I think it's not the 90s anymore. Uh, we found a route, and we could just uh, essentially post to this route uh, a parameter that was a shell command, and we could just shell the box. GG, easy mode. All right, hard transition. Now we're getting to some wireless work. Uh, what you see up on the screen is an XR11 voice remote, and these are actually pretty cool. So uh, the way they work, uh, once you pair it with your set-top box, they communicate over RF instead of IR, so you can be super lazy and just point it anywhere you want. Uh, also, they have a built-in microphone and a button, and you press the button and you talk to the mic, and you're like, hey, um, do something, or you can query it, like you're talking to Siri or Alexa. Or like, disable my home security system. Yeah, that, that, this is a thing, whichever. So uh, the, the query goes up to your ISP's cloud, and then it comes back down, or just executes locally. Yeah, it's pretty slick. Um, these things have a CC2530 chip in them, and I suspect they're running remote TI, which is the reference design. You guys should look into it. 
All right, so getting into the RF. The protocol they use to communicate over RF is called RF4CE, Radio for Consumer Electronics. It's a Zigbee standard based on 802.15.4, and it defines the way pairs of devices communicate with one another. Uh, one of the de devices takes on the role of controller, which is the remote. The other takes on the role of target, in our case, the set-top box, and it defines how uh, commands get sent from one device to another. So the vast majority of RF4CE devices support encryption out of the box, as you should. But if you're a bad guy, you can listen to the key exchange, which is done in the clear, or just force a rekeying, and then you can decrypt all of the traffic, which is, I, I hear that's no bueno. Uh, this code is going to be online in a day or a week or whenever it is allowed to be online. So, built on top of RF4CE is another standard called Open Cable, and this uh, defines exactly how the remote sends key presses to the set-top box. It also defines the way that you uh, conduct the binding process. So, as an end user, you press setup, mash the Xfinity button a couple times, and then a pin appears on your television. You enter it on your remote, and then you're dandy, and you're paired, and that's great. And generally, you have uh, five to ten tries uh, before you have to actually reinitiate the binding process. And we discovered that this binding process wasn't rate limited, okay? So if you had really, really fast hands or a way of instrumenting this whole thing, yeah, uh, that, that'd be great. So that's what we did. Uh, what you see, the chip you see on the right is a Teensy Arduino hooked up over SPY to an ADF7242P mod. I love this chip. Out of the box, it supports Bluetooth, BLE, uh, 802.15.4, unmanaged and managed, and arbitrary GFSK. If that's something that you all get excited about, please read the white paper. It's pretty cool. So we implemented enough of the RF4CE stack and the open cable stack to go through this binding process. And in practice, it takes less than a second to do it and we could force pair our device to a set-top box in under two hours. And after you force pair a device, you can pull up uh, the diagnostics menu and enable remote web inspector and shell the set-top box. Okay, so bringing the shelled set-top box back into the mix, um, as I said, RDK has fantastic logging. So we were just it's grepping. So verbose. It's so verbose. <laughs> so we were <laughs> grepping around the logs for anything having to do with RF4CE, right? And it turns out we were very easily able to discover the update daemon for the RF4CE remote. We thought it would be really cool if we could push an over the air update to this remote and make a remote listening device. I mean, that, that'd be pretty cool, right? I totally didn't do that. Yeah, yeah, we haven't gotten that far yet. You, you guys should do it. But we did prove that um, you can push an OTA to the remote. And the reason you can do this is because there's no crypto involved, meaning the firmware payload isn't signed. It's just protected by a CRC. So all we had to do was make a few minor modifications to the update binary, the configuration it read, and then we made modifications to the firmware payload so we could verify that the over-the-air update was in fact good. Then we changed the CRC of the firmware package and pushed the OTA. And if you look up on the screen, the reported firmware version is generally 1.0.1.0, I think, and we are the only ones with a remote with firmware version 1.3.3.7. So uh, now we'll take a look at the uh specific devices that we've looked at, as well as the disclosure process and remediation actions taken by the affected vendors. So here we have a list of devices we found vulnerabilities in. Uh, I want to highlight the Technicolor Time Warner device there. Uh, we have no code execution on this device. This was a vulnerability where we had, you know, weak guessable default Wi-Fi credentials. We have two Cisco modems with code execution, a Technicolor and Eris modem with code execution, this Motorola set-top box with code execution, and then the voice remote with the over-the-air firmware update that we can push. And in an effort to be diligent, we've looked at a lot of devices from various ISPs to see if we can reproduce these vulnerabilities. So we looked at devices from Spectrum MediaCom, Time Warner, Virgin Media, Virgin Media Unity Media, Cox, and one Xfinity device which did not run RDK. Uh, this is not to say that these devices have no vulnerabilities. In fact, we do have other vulnerabilities in disclosure that we can't speak about yet. Uh, but, you know, we found a lot of devices that run RDK, but a lot of devices that do not run RDK. 
We found these vulnerabilities over the course of multiple months, and so we disclosed them to the affected vendors in four groups. We had the first two groups in March, the second two groups in April. The first public knowledge of this project was on July 11th, and there was a really unfortunate mishap with the hosting provider that DEF CON used for the DEF CON website, which was preventing customers from Comcast and some other ISPs from hitting the website when our app track was released, just an unfortunate mishap. And then we publicly disclosed these vulnerabilities today. I want to point out that all of the unauthenticated RCE attack chains affecting the Comcast devices have been remediated. Customers of other ISPs are invited to contact their ISP to find out if their devices run RDK, if they're vulnerable, and if they've been patched. And as I said before, we haven't had enough time to go in detail on all the vulnerabilities because we found too many CVEs, which is a good problem to have. So we invite you to go to our link to the white paper, as you see there, to uh, so be up on GitHub. Wait, but it's not the link, by the way. <laughs> Uh, so we have you know, a pretty verbose technical course. detail in the white paper, and you know we found a lot of very critical vulnerabilities, but all of the worst attack chains have been patched. I want to thank you guys for watching our talk. I want to thank Bastille for supporting our research. And I want to thank Comcast for mediating these attack chains. Thank you. Yeah, and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna say this real quick. Uh, the first time I heard about DEF CON was when I was 13 years old, and I always wanted to be a part of this. Uh, and I've been submitting for four years. We finally got in. It means the world for you guys to be here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.